What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Contractor Secrets Podcast. Special guest today, Benny Fisher of Big Fish Contracting up in Pittsburgh. Uh, home run hitter. This guy has created quite the business and is bringing some sales strategy to us here on the Contractor Secrets Podcast and really just kind of just insight on what it's like to grow uh, a massive uh, roofing company. And uh, this guy is uh, this guy's on point. So uh, yeah, excited to share with you some sales strategy, really just understanding what goes into growing and scaling uh, a company and hearing Benny's story. And it starts right now. Contractors all over the world are wanting more, more time, more freedom, more impact. The way we do this is through implementing systems, processes, standards. Welcome to the Contractor Secrets Podcast. Here we hit business strategy, coaching, mindset, motivation, the tools you need for success. So strap in, listen up, and get ready to grow on the Contractor Secrets Podcast. Cool, man. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I uh, heard some good things about you from uh, Skyler, man. I appreciate you wanting to jump on uh, our podcast, man. Sounds good. Give me a quick brief. On what, me? Yeah. So Entrepreneur started a um, contracting company seven years ago. Just finished up with, I think, $8 million in revenue. I'm also an influencer and like I call it like more of like a brand ambassador kind of in the roofing industry. I uh, go to all the conferences, um, partnered with a marketing firm called Contractor Dynamics. I do a lot of business coaching there and uh, just all about creating brand. I have a sales background, um, but now I'm more focused on brand building and, uh, you know, leadership and business organization. Cool. Yeah, and, yeah. And, what are some and, topics you want to hit today? So whatever you want, man, what's your audience need? Um, you know, I would say that uh, a, a large, you know, it's a large majority of my audience is, you know, doing under 2 million in revenue. Um, uh -huh. You know, really just trying to get some systems together. Culture is important. Um, you know, so I think what we'll do is just kind of just jump right into, you know, again, a little bit more of a deeper dive into your story. Um, and then, you know, I, I just like going off the top, man. I've never been good at rehearsing these type of things so no that's good man i um just so you know i have like a hard stop like at 10 o'clock so i have like uh are you at eastern time yeah likewise so yeah, we'll, we'll cool. make it right. happen cool i wasn't Great. sure how long it was supposed to go so no you're good man you're good um and then is there a company you want me to reference when i do my intro here um yeah big fish contracting company is my contracting company got it. i got cool. a website bennyfisher.com got it got it what is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Contractor Secrets Podcast today. I'm here with Benjamin Fisher uh, with the Big Fish Contracting Company, man. Welcome, Ben. I appreciate you uh, jumping in. Uh, interestingly enough, those of you that listen to this, you might have heard the name Skylar Stewart. He connected me with this gentleman, someone that uh, Skylar considers a mentor to him. Uh, welcome, Ben. I, I appreciate you uh, jumping on. Excited to have you here, man. Thanks, Tanner. Can't wait to uh, share some of the, uh, the secrets yeah man that's it so give us a quick synopsis man you gave me a brief but uh let's hear it man would uh would, you know give it give us give us a little rundown of who you are what you do and what you built so i'm originally from canton ohio uh moved to pittsburgh 12 years ago i had a career in sales in like my 20s like with uh, car dealerships and worked at ge money verizon wireless and then i got fired a bunch of different times and i couldn't really find my way and got up got mixed up with some of the wrong people, ended up selling drugs, got a felony conviction. I uh, thought my life was over. My uncle, who was in commercial roofing at the time, just started his business in Pittsburgh, said, hey, come over and help me with sales and marketing. I was like, wow, I got a second chance at life. So I moved to Pittsburgh, didn't know a single person, worked with him for five years and really learned the sale or learned the roofing side of things, you know, the trade specific small business stuff. I always thought I wanted to have a dream in corporate America that kind of went out the window. So I was learning roofing and obviously I didn't like the roofing part of it. I liked the sales side of it better. And then I was looking at marketing as social media was starting to pop off like 2010, 11. I started helping some small businesses in my community with their Facebook page. So started a little marketing business on the side and then realized I had too many of my own ideas and wanted to start my own business. So in 2015, I started a residential roofing company in Pittsburgh with the brand. It's called the Big Fish Contracting Company with a cool yellow cartoon fish. 
nobody at the time was being really professional using technology, using systems processes, you know, giving customers a really great experience. You know, it was pretty much, you know, a bunch of chuck in the trucks, if you will. And uh, I was like, man, I can do this and we can do it a lot better. So that's what we've been doing for the last seven years and uh, just heading into my eighth year. We've uh, probably hit 8 million in revenue last year. I think a real close 7.9 something. And uh, we're on a projection by 2030, want to be a $50 million con contractor in the, the greater Pittsburgh area. That's amazing, man. So you guys strictly do roofing or do you do more than just that? Roofing, siding, gutters is what we specialize yeah. in. I, I, yeah, I tell the all the contractors to, to, to very like focus, you know, and at first it just was roofing for us. Then we added cool, gutters cool. and then siding, but uh, I see a lot of contractors start to try to do too many things and it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. So you went from salesperson to business owner. I mean, it seems like it was a pretty significant jump. I mean, someone who's, you know, obviously commissions and profit are two different things. I mean, was it a money thing or was it, I need to do this thing? Like, was it just like a calling to start this thing? And, you know, how was the transition from leaving the company you were at to starting your own? Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, you know, I knew I could sell and generate enough on my own. Um, and I knew enough, you know, I, I was managing the projects. I was basically doing everything except for, you know, maybe paying bills and, and doing invoicing. Uh, so I was doing a little bit of marketing. I was doing all the sales. I was doing all the operations before to the, you know, as far as scheduling the crews and stuff like that. Sure. So I knew that part, I could, I could do that myself, but for me, it was more about like trying to put my own spin on it. Right. So if trying to like have my own creation, it was more about creating something and right. then, you know, be able to create a workplace that people would want to work at and a place that people could thrive and grow because sure. every company I ever worked at, even including my uncles, there was a ceiling and you like, there just wasn't anywhere to go. So um, that's kind of why I did that. Gotcha. Yeah. And in terms of like, you know, your background in sales, I sold cars. So, you know, I understand, you know, the trainings and, you know, the, the, you know, the different closing techniques and all this, I mean, transitioning from going from selling cars and doing a, a sales job like that, a lot, a little more aggressive, sometimes lacks a little bit of integrity. You know, it sounds like I see, you know, the big fish cares podcast. I think what you represent is someone that wants to give back, wants to help. And I'm sure that, that, you know, that was a shift for you, right. Going into the roofing space where it's not as aggressive as car sales. I mean, was it, was it refreshing to not feel the pressure of like, you know, and essentially you're, you're helping more people than you are when you're selling cars. At least I believe that was the transition I made. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always had the during my sales career, I always like cared about the customer and always cared about what they did. I never sold the most. Um, I always wanted to sell the most, but then I realized that like, because of integrity and because I always want to do the right thing and, you know, whether a customer was supposed to buy something or not, I would tell people, Hey man, that's probably not my, might not be the good fit. I always right. kind of sold like that, but it, you're right. It did performance wise. Like, you know, it, it never was the best because, um, you know, your manager, your boss, if you look like, you know, looking at you, like you never did enough. So when I got into home sales, especially, you know, at my uncle's company, it was kind of like, Hey, if somebody calls, you know, we're gonna go take care of them. Right. It wasn't, uh, you know, you're not like, you know, slamming them at their kitchen table. So it was very passive, um, and very, um, you know, kind of just really helping people. And I, and I like that about the, uh, the trades, it is competitive. I will say it's getting more and more competitive. So you do have to increase your sales skill and, and really focus on your process because if you don't want to just go out and wing it every time, um, like I did in the first couple of years. How many salespeople do you have working for the company? Uh, we have six. Six. And in terms of, you know, keeping them motivated, what are some things that you're doing? Oh, you know, we do like, we have a Monday meeting um, every uh, Monday where for the first hour we go over like a, maybe a training topic, you know, something, whether it's either a sales topic or maybe a trade specific topic or maybe a piece of technology. The next meeting we go over our numbers and high five all the wins for the week before and kind of everybody gives us their predictions for the current week. Uh, we do like five minute huddles every morning where everybody just humps on a Zoom call and kind of just go over what we're doing for the day. Uh, we have one on ones. Our sales manager meets with our salespeople one on one. We have a, um, a Tuesday night training that we do. We have, a, I think, Wednesday uh, power hour calling thing where they just call and, and call customers and try to follow up and they kind of like get uh you know, they kind of, you know, get competitive, right. And see who can like, you know, sure. maybe turn something into a deal. Right. Because right. where you put focus is where you'll find success. And uh, I find a lot of salespeople that get lost in the white space. So if you're not constantly moving and constantly doing something to move the business forward, you know, you'll just kind of sit there and get complacent. So you being at the top, I mean, the production side obviously has its quirks. I mean, how have you found peace on the production side generating $8 million worth of roofing and siding and gutter jobs? I mean, I'm sure you run into the same issues we all do, right? 
I don't anymore. I'm actually out of the day to day. I only, I only spend about four hours a week in, at this business. Um, cause I have somebody run the company. Right. And, and, and then they have, uh, we have managers at every level, right? We have a roofing manager, a siding manager, a gutter manager. We have an operation coordinator inside the, the office and, you know, they're all responsible getting for getting their jobs done and their numbers in and, and the five-star reviews. And, um, you know, it's day in and day out and they report that up to, to their manager and, you know, if there's a problem, you know, they solve that with the president of the company and, and, and one of the people on the operations team from the leadership team. And then they, they solve the problems every once in a while. I still have to get involved if it's an emotional customer or something like that, because I'm usually a little bit better with, um, the tone and the words. And, you know, sometimes they like to to see from the founder, you know, but, uh, it's, uh, it's getting less and less as I put in more layers of organization and, and better systems. You know, what's the biggest challenge of that? I mean, I feel like, you know, I speak to a lot of people and many people listen to this or all the way it's still at the founder level after three years, you know, four years, five years. And by founder level, I mean, no salesperson, no management help, just kind of treading water. And I think a lot of the fear is the marketing, uh, you know, the, the fear of investing in marketing and just kind of the, I would just say the, the assurance of consistent lead flow. I mean, did that ever cross your mind? I mean, what did you do to combat that early on? Well, I was always focused. I always had more leads than I knew what to handle because I, I was, I, I went in with marketing in mind. And remember when I told you that short story of how I was helping these little businesses in town with their Facebook marketing. So sure. I had had like that, that mentality of like, all right, well, we're going to, I'm going to produce good content on social media. I'm going to, you know, then run tactical ads. And I've been doing that from the beginning. And I was able to create a brand that I call like five mile famous. Um, so then that way it's got that recognition. So that way, when I combine that with the digital ads, they see the truck wraps, they see the job site signs, they see me sponsor the kids team at school. I don't necessarily have to be full-time in the marketing department. So I never had a full-time marketing person until just this past year um, where we hired someone full-time to really just help produce content, manage one of the agencies that we're, that we're trying to hold accountable. Because what I find most small business owners do, if you don't have a mindset for marketing and you hire the wrong agency or hire the wrong company, they're going to just burn your money to the ground because they don't, they don't want to be held accountable. You don't even know what questions to ask them. You don't even know what numbers you should be tracking. And so that money usually gets lit on fire if you, if you don't pay right. attention. So that's why I, I don't think the, the solopreneur can, can get out as fast, you know? Sure. Sure. And I think, you know, I've found that, you know, in our, you know, the majority of the people that listen to this are mostly in the painting, painting industry. What are some similarities you see and what are some drawbacks? I mean, you know, roofing, you hear, just, you know, roofing, I mean, it's just, I mean, in terms of scale, I mean, the norm is subcontractor model, but you very rarely hear of companies scaling big time with them, with the employee model. Was that ever a question for you? I mean, did you ever consider doing the employee model? Well, I mean, we have employees at sales and project management and service tax and marketing. I mean, we have 25 employees. So, but the, our crews are subcontracted. Um, because, you know, the, the, those guys are, you know, they have a high, you know, they, they're kind of a team already. They already work together. You only have to rely on one guy and you have to talk to him, make sure that, you know, right. their team shows up. So it's easy to scale because you got, you know, you got a leader, right. And you can pay that leader. Right. They, they manage their team. Yeah. We've had the same crews, you know, ever since the beginning. So that's probably been my most standard, you know, thing is with them is that we know what they're going to charge. We know that they're going to show up and it's yep. just, you know, it's well managed. Right. And, yeah. um, and so I like that. We still have an employee from uh, from Big Fish, obviously coordinate with them and kind of work in, in partnership sure. and tandem. And and uh, you know the difference with pe- roofing and painting is roofing we have about triple the size of uh, of job cost. You know of our job. You know my average job is probably fifteen thousand. I would say the average painting job is probably well, I don't know five okay. five thousand. Yeah. So right. and again, I can get my jobs done in a day. Where you guys might have to be there for two or three days. You know maybe four days to right. get a painting job done. So it's the you know the, it is a little bit of a different model. Um, but what I will say is in painting, you have an easier chance to stick out now because there's not as many prof- roofing is starting to catch up with like a lot of these bigger professional companies, right? Kind of the ones like I'm running, but painting, right. I still see like, there's only like, like maybe one or two in every market, you know, where roofers, there's like 15 or 20 where painters, yeah. there's really only like one or two, maybe creeping up that are trying to do things the right way with proper branding, you know, customer, great customer service and not that chuck in a truck you know, that, that shows up with, you know, paint splatter all over himself, Man. cigarettes in his mouth. And, you know, I think it's going to come, you know, I think it's painting just a little bit behind. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so too. I think, you know, early on when you started though, it was probably at the same point that painting is now. I think yeah. painting is 
I think like Payne's like 10 years behind. I really feel that way. Um, ab lacking, absolutely. Lacking absolutely. in software, lacking in events, lacking in uh, community. I mean, I think, dude, the roofing community is like a, a rock concert the way I see it, man. You guys just go, just go. Do you hit any roofing events this year? Do you ever participate in yeah. any of those? Yeah. So now that I've been able to elevate out and I hired a president to run the company, that's all I do. I actually, actually help um, contractors, you know, with their marketing. I work for a marketing training company and I, and I do business coaching for those like positive okay. uh, people in their marketing training. And so I'm at roof, I'm at roof, I went to RoofCon. I'm going to be at the IRE. I went, I'm going to a roofing process conference here in Orlando in February. Um, you know, GAF wealth builder, you know, I, I did a small tour with one industry, one model where I got to uh, do a couple talks from stage to kind of help contractors with process and sales. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I got my ear to the ground on the national scene too, because as we scale, you know, we may want to open up stores around the country and it's a good way to see what other guys are doing, you know, in the marketplace. Sure. And uh, it's a good way to learn. You, I mean, you know, you've pivoted to, you know, returning and helping out, you know, I would think some of the little guys, right? I mean, do you, do you help out the little guys? I mean, in, in my in market, other, outside of my market. Yeah. I mean, I had a sales training last year that I opened it up to anybody that wanted to come and I had, uh, I had 25 people there and 15 of them were contractors and the other 10 were my sales people and some people from my team. And, you know, and they paid money to come and learn what we're doing. And we had some local people there and a lot of people think that's weird. And uh, even some people in my own company, they're like, oh, don't teach the competition. And I'm like, no, I'm going to teach everybody because you still have to go do okay. it, right? You still have to go right. do it. And I actually want to be around and working with guys that are that are doing well because a rising boat, sure. a rising tide raises all boats, right? So if if they're uh, doing better, it creates a better market for me even. Uh, so I agree with of, that. It's kind of why I'm on that mission, right? To help. I'd rather uh, compete. I'd rather compete with three people that have gotten sales training than someone that's just, you know, shooting up a number you know yeah because it, I mean, it confuses the customer yeah because customers don't know the difference between a five thousand dollar no. painting contract and a six thousand dollar painting contract if it's just they all don't. about the painting right they don't so what are some things you know you would I, you know i kind of want to extract a little bit of sales knowledge from you i mean i think you would find that you know some people struggle with uh sales in the painting space majority i would say just from my experience they're they're going and doing an estimate um, they're building some value. Right. And then as soon as, you know, it's time to present the price, they say, all right, well, I'll go ahead and email you that quote. When I get home, that's not what your salespeople do. I assume. Right. No, 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 no. So you can't do that. That's just called showing up or, and throwing up, or if that's, if you want to talk about yourself, showing up you and throwing up, yeah. is that what it's called? Yeah. Show up and throw up <laughs> as if you're a salesman that goes in, tells everybody how great they are, gives them a price and walks out. The other one is quote and hope where you go and then you email them a bid and you just hope that they answer that you find a signed quote contract in your email box. Quote and hope and, and showing up and throwing up is when you, you show up, you give the price and then you run away. Yeah. Or you just tell them, you know, you go in and tell them how great you are, you know, and they didn't even ask, ask any questions. You know, you're like, oh, I'm the best painting contractor in the world. This is why we're the greatest. $5,000. Here you go, man. That's showing up and throwing up. The other side of that, the, you know, is going there, you know, just like strictly just give, measuring their house and then leaving and then emailing them a quote and hoping. Right. And then there's the spray and pray. you know, where you're just like, you know, just giving as many quotes as possible, hoping somebody buys, you know, so all those three are what usually most salespeople fall into that are, are not trained, right? But at the end of the day, the simple thing is, you know, show up, build some rapport, right? Because you got to sell yourself. People buy off the, who, who they know, like, and trust. You then got to ask them connecting questions, right? You got to really connect with the client and really find compelling reasons and try to drive emotions to why they want to buy, you know, give, get some experience of, uh, from bad contractors and stories that they've had in the past that happened to them, because you know, when the, you give them the price, they're gonna be like, Oh, you're a little bit too high. You know, the other guy, well, you want to be able to tie it back to a time when what they, they was different the, about that experience. Right. Right. Yeah. All those questions yeah. you want, you want to find out about their current situation. You want to find out what their desired situation looks like. Cause you want to be able to make sure that you can help them solve their problem because why are they calling you versus Chuck in the truck, because if they only need Chuck in the truck, you should just probably tell them to call Chuck in the truck. But usually most of your customers want somebody that's professional, somebody that they know right. they can trust if there's a problem. Right. And you have to be able to demonstrate that through asking great questions, because most customers, nobody asks their whole life. Right. Whether it's, you know, if it's a husband, the, the wife and the family, the, the, nobody talks to people at home. Right. Nobody, nobody cares what's going on when you're at work. That guy's getting beat up at work, too. So when you're a contractor and you show up and you just listen to a client or a homeowner, you might be the first person that listened to them all day. 
And that's usually enough to get the sale. Just ask them good questions and shut up. You know, it's hard for a lot of salespeople or entrepreneurs to do, but it's really kind of where it's at. And sometimes you got to create more of a problem and more of a pain situation for them. If they right. don't have one, you have to kind of find one and kind of poke holes and, and get that pain uh -huh. to kind of, uh, kind of intensify. So then that way, when you go to solve their problem, you, you, you just look, you look like the no brainer option in their book. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes sense from someone that's trained a bunch of salespeople and is very good at what they do. That was uh paraphrase really well. I think, you know, as I try to help with sales too, I, I always, you know, an easy thing that I've done is always start off with the question, what's the story and just let them you know, unload on me. What, mm. what did, why I'm here? There's a reason deeper than the fact that you want your house painted. I say, what's the story, you know, and that's such a nice opener for me. Um, and I think uh, you're absolutely right, man. There's in any capacity, you know, we're, we're here to solve problems. We're not here to paint, you know, we're going to solve your problem, but I think I want you to be aware of some problems that could happen too, that you're not aware of right now. And I think what's interesting, you know, you know, this, there's usually a 10 to 15 year gap between the time that they've had this, this thing done before, you know? So I'm sure, let me ask you this though. Do you train your team to be buyer, buyer beware, or do you kind of just emphasize your highlights with the, you know, the notion of, Hey, you know, not all companies are going to do this. Like, in other words, like, you know, we're not bashing competitors, but we're also highlighting value. Like we know that, you know, a roofing company could come in and leave nails all over your house. So in other words, we're not, we're saying, Hey, one thing that we do is that we make sure we go around with the magnet, you know, like, do you, how do you approach, approach that? So that's why I get them to usually, I try to get them to tell a story about a personal st story that they have with a bad experience. I find out okay. what they don't like about it. Cause what I want to do is I want to keen in on a bad experience that they had. It doesn't matter with what kind of contractor. If they don't have a personal bad experience, I say, well, do you know somebody that has had a bad experience and tell me what Good that's one. like? Basically, all I'm trying to do a hypothetical, right? I just need them to tell a story of like what went wrong. And then I only want to key in on the pain that they describe because that's the only pain that they actually care about. Wow. That's the only fear that they have in their mind. Because if you do it the other way where you're just, you tell them like, hell, you know, these other companies don't, you know, clean up with a magnet. They might not even know that's a problem because they they might just look at you as a salesperson trying to like oversell something that they don't care about. Sure. So you got to find the two or three things that they like bring up, whether it's not showing up on time, attention to detail, you know, um, overcharging, right? Whatever they say, those are the only things that matter when you go to the close. And when you go, I always recommend having a small slide deck with a story of your company before you go over the price. Right. And when you're going through that, find a couple of things in your company story and, or your process story about how that can tie back to the pain that they described earlier. I don't like to solve. As soon as they tell me that pain, I don't like to solve that pain right away because I want to yeah. walk them a little bit through, further through the sales process. I actually want to find the cost of not doing business the right way. I want to tie it to a number as well as a feeling. And then I want to make sure they have the ability to buy from us because not every customer is a customer that I actually want to do business with. So if they don't have a sharp enough or enough pain or enough of a problem and they don't really have the ability to like see the justify, difference. there's no way they could justify. The yeah. Price. If they, yeah. If they, if, if they, you know, they don't want to pay a little extra to do business with me. I actually asked them that, Hey, do you, you know, this right. is after we go through all that pain, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, are you willing to pay a little bit more to do business with me? You know, and right there. Of course, most people are going to say yes, because you're right in front of them, right? As long as you've done a good job. You just want them to agree to that, right? Um, and the one to 10, I'm sorry, I messed that up. One to 10 is like, how fat, you know, how soon, how, how well do they want this done right? You know, like I always say that hey, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you want this thing done right and to the best, they're always going to say 10. Then you follow it up with, are you willing to pay just a little bit more to do business with me? And if they say no, right, then you got to back it up because you already know that they don't see enough value, right? And and what you're doing, but most customers in front of you, they'll say that, right? That's why you can keep going to the next step. But if at any time you feel like there's something fishy about this client, or maybe like this customer is going to give us a problem, or I don't know, I, you know, you think about after the job, like I kick them back out. I don't even give them a price. So right, I just right. tell them, hey, I don't think it looks, doesn't look like we're the good fit, right? And uh, and then they they'll either get like, whoa, 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 why? And then be like, well, because you don't really have that big of a problem. It sounds like this guy down the street can probably do it a little bit better for you and cheaper. Um, and it's probably just not going to be enough value there for you to do business with me. And then find out what they say to that, right? But that's an advanced right. move. And you, you, know, you don't have to pull that's, that out. That's uh, a scary move right there. That's a review waiting to happen <laughs> for some people. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never, I've actually gotten, I've gotten good reviews and, and, and not done business with people because I've actually referred them to a cheaper person. 
How about that? And then they've actually that? reviewed me and actually gave me a referral for somebody else. You know, they're, they're one of their richer friends, you know, sure. and, they'll, and they'll laugh sure. about it. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah I can't afford that? you, but guess what? Johnny can. <laughs> I know we're short on time, but I want to hit on, on, you know, something you said in terms of when you're asking people about their experience. And it's funny, man, I, I do incorporate that in some of my, you know, my training and some of the things I talk about, but what you do is you pivot to, okay, well, you didn't have a bad experience. Do so you know someone that does that opens up the wheelhouse, right? <laughs> you know, that's you. Usually when someone tells me they haven't had a good experience, sometimes I kind of like freeze up. Right. I'm like, Oh, okay. You have, or, or they haven't had an experience at all. Right. They've never got their house painted. So I'm like, uh, okay, well, let me tell you how this is going to go. Like, so that's a great pivot to, Hey, do you know someone else that's had it? Had also say, experience? imagine the word imagine. Hey, so imagine like, what's the worst case scenario yeah. for you? Right. Um, you just want them dreaming a little bit. Same thing if you don't have a husband and wife. I strongly recommend when you book these appointments, you have both people there, right? If you guys are in residential. But let's just say you only have one person there and you, you end up giving them a price. And of course, they're going to be like, oh, hey, I got to talk to my wife. Well, what do you think she's going to say about all this? And you just you just hypothetically say like, because you're on their side, right? Hey, right. So how does she typically make these decisions? What does she typically look for? How do you know, what do you think she's going to say? Because wh whatever he says there that whatever that customer says it's usually those insecurities that are in his brain and anyway when they come out but most people are afraid to tell you interesting if it's about them yeah she's gonna say she's gonna say well you know we probably want to get a few more estimates right like, yeah and then you say why do, why does she like get to three why does she like to get all these extra estimates you know does she right. like meeting with contractors and then you just get them talking and you find is out that, where is the, that fun <laughs> yeah and you find out where the objection is right so i mean sales is great i can nerd out on sales all day um there's lots of different awesome sales trainers out there yeah. i'd say follow follow a process and stick to the process is the most important and make sure yeah, that very uh, good very very good so, dude you, you're you're top notch i know we're short on time um, I wanted to be able to give you some value for jumping in on my podcast. What's a good way uh, for some of our listeners who want to take it to the next level in their sales process to be able to reach out to you? Just go to BennyFisher.com and uh, follow me on social media and message me. And uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, put a workshop together or something for these guys. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, Benny. I appreciate uh, your time, energy, and effort on uh, Contractor Secrets Podcast. I think we'll have to connect again soon, man. Thanks. Appreciate being here. All right. Hey, thanks so much for checking out the Contractor Secrets Podcast. Stick around. I am going to drop in a short testimonial uh, that one of our awesome heavy hitters in Drip Jobs uh, had agreed to give out for us. So if you want to hear a little bit about how Drip Jobs is helping contractors, stick around uh, for the end of this episode and you can listen in. What's up, everyone? I got my good friend Aaron here, Bounty Painting who just reinvented himself as he put it in his own words in terms of growing his business. Um, he was on a business breakthrough. So if you've heard of him before, it's probably because you listened to his breakthrough session. Uh, Drip Jobs user. And today he's going to share with us some raw, authentic thoughts. We have not rehearsed this, so it could be bad. It could be good. I don't know. If it's bad, I probably won't post this. If it's good. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Aaron, what's up, brother? How you doing? Man, I'm, I'm great, man. Tell me, man, let's get, tell me your thoughts, man. So you've been using it for now three months. Um, you were not a skeptic. You really just went all in because you believed in me, which I appreciate. But again, that doesn't make up for whether the software is good or bad. So tell me your thoughts, man. What has it been doing for you? Uh, right out of the gate, it follows up. And even if you're good at sales, that is the hardest thing, especially, I mean, if you want to be really successful, you got to get good at cold calling. However, it beats everybody up. And if you've been told no by the same person two, maybe three times, it beats you up. That's just the way humans are. The best salesman I know, it beats you up. Yep. Drip Ups does it for you automatically. Yeah. One of the first jobs I got, I, I think I signed up in like October, um, maybe very early November. And instantly, um, I got a referral off the internet. and I set them up through drip jobs. It was my very first, and I know it's not this way with everybody, but it was my very first drip jobs uh, set up. It followed up with them. I got a five-star review, organic, completely, well, not related to them. Sure. Uh, he loved the communication. I've had, I've got several stories like that. You follow up, you give them a proposal, and it's not that I forget about it. I don't have to continue to worry about all right did i follow up in a day did i follow yeah. up and there's been a couple of times when people are like hey leave me alone i'll let you know when i'm ready 
you can disable drip jobs. It's completely customizable. It's it's made it pays for itself. Yeah, I love that, man. And I think, you know, early on, it's like, well, I think that's too much communication. And my argument is, well, here's the deal. It's either you have something doing this or you have to do it. And if you have to do it, then you, chances are with how busy you are, you don't do it. And then right. nobody's happy. So, um, you know, for anyone thinking that this is too much communication, honestly, do you feel like your customers are bombarded with communication or do you feel as though it's the right amount? Customers are appreciative and the, 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 the sum, the average customer, not the, not the outliers who just don't like it, but the average customer, do you think appreciate the communication? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Um, That's what and wanted. point of view, cold calling is king. Sure. Um, you, you have to do that. It does it for you. Like I said, um, it has, I'm your customer. Sure. It me more money. Like for example, I got an email and one of my drips is an email saying, Hey, we couldn't wait any longer. I got two jobs two <laughs> ten jobs in the last two. $10,000 jobs in the last 30 days because of that email. That's crazy. Here's the one thing. Anybody looking at drip jobs, go through and read all the drips. Because on the first one of those jobs, I always do an exit interview. Why'd you pick me? How many bids did you get? Yeah. Yada, yada. And I'm like, well, I got your email. And she said, the customer said, that was your email. I'm like, oh, wow. so I looked. Yeah. But I was glad it happened. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, go through it first. So, you know, when the customer responds to you, like what it is that you're doing now, yeah. some people think like, all right, well, drip jobs is like this, you know, communication thing. That's cool. But it's not just that, right. You can create proposals. You can project manage. Like what we're trying to do is create an all-in-one solution for you in terms of the proposal presentation. We just released an update on the look and feel of it. What do you think of that, man? Is it, is it helping you in terms of uh, showcasing how professional you are based off of how it looks? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You look, that's one of the things I always get in, an, get in an exit interview. If they've had three bids or two bids or whatever, my price is usually right in there closer to sure. the top. Um, what I get my proposals on is professionalism, mm -hmm. um, the way I communicate, which is all drip jobs. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it takes all of that off my plate. Sure. Um, in my business breakthrough in October, November, or whatever it was, um, I didn't have any employees. I got four employees. I'm just Huge. now, I'm just now starting to be able to, to not have to be at the job. I still have to set them up. I don't have a lead yeah. painter. Oh, you're um, killing it, man. But I don't have to be on the job. A huge part of that is drip jobs. Wow. Yeah. Just able to schedule, communicate with my customers, uh, current customers, um, potential customers it's for for the price point and i hate to say this to you because i like the price point i'm at for the price point it's and there's no contract you don't have to sign up for a year you don't have to sign no. and if you sign i don't even let any i don't even let anyone do that right it's a no-brainer wow my, I mean, I, my, you can't say it any better someone told me yesterday they would pay a thousand dollars per month for it and i said easy buddy yeah. Slow down. Slow down, slow pal. Now I'm kidding. I love it. You know, and it's awesome. Like in any situation, Aaron, like even me as a painting contractor and the way that I sell, realistically, I want to create more value than, than you feel like you're going to get. Like, in other words, I want to exceed your expectation. That's how you run your business, right? Like your customer right. pays you X amount of money. And then even though like you could do the bare minimum, it's natural for business owners that care to go a little above and beyond. And it's like, you know, I love that, man, because that's one of my goals is to like, wow you. And I think that, the, you know, the barrier is, is that in the same way, you ready for this? In the same way that when customers interview us as their painters, Aaron, they see the price and they instantly compare it to the people that came before them. And, and it's one of those things where it's like, well, this company came in at, you know, half your price. And it's like, okay, well, Drip jobs is on the higher end, which isn't really that much. I call, I say, I tell people it's three gallons of paint a month, right? So you waste your three gallons of paint. You could have bought drip jobs right. at 147, but listen, the other estimating and invoicing softwares are 30 bucks, 40 bucks. And that's one of the barriers of entry. People say, well, Joyce is 30 bucks. 
or QuickBooks is $25. And right. it's like, so let me ask you, if you had someone tell you that, what would you say to them to justify the 147 if they went for the advanced plan, which our lowest plan is 97? What would you say to them? I don't have any short answers. I had a car dealer tell me one time they put new brakes and new rotors on when they did an oil change on a vehicle that I had just purchased. And I went in to pick it up from the oil change. And I said, hey, did you get a chance to look at the brakes? And he says, yeah, we put new pads and new rotors on. And I said, not only are you not charging me for it, you're not, you weren't going to mention it. And he said, Aaron, here's the deal. He says, if you don't like me, you're going to tell everybody you ever met. Mm -hmm. If you love me, if you love me, the flip side of that, you're going to tell a few people when you remember to. Sure. You and I and every painter, every contractor out there is in the same boat. Um, the price, like you said, three gallons of paint, it's not like it's 10 times the price of your competition. It's a little more than your competition. It is also tailored to you. Right. It um to be honest i couldn't accept uh credit cards before it it happens seam seamlessly uh yeah. to be my reviews i get more yeah. organic leads now because it asks for a review and at the end of every job in my exit interview i'm like all right you're gonna get a link to leave me a review please leave me a five-star review if not let me know why let me wow before i guarantee you're getting 90 percent reviews every single time so it is worth that. Wow. And it is dedicated to, not dedicated, it's primarily uh, scaled to the painting industry. It is. Uh, so for three gallons of paint a month, as an owner or a decision maker in your company, what's your time worth? Sure. What's your time worth? That's the good question what, right there. What, what's your time worth? I know what I mean. I booked two $10,000 jobs because I didn't have to follow up. Let's cut that in half. Two $5,000 jobs. Sure. What's your time worth to follow up on those? Yeah. To send pictures, yep. to find the pictures, to do all of that monkey business. What's yeah. your time? Wow. It's easily worth that. Joy. Last, qu last question. All right. So somebody justifies the expense, right? But here's yep. the other side of this man, I got to learn a whole new software, right? I got to figure out how to do it. How easy is the software? Uh, every single software takes, I hate it because it's a buzzword, a minute. This literally took about a minute. And one of the things that I have, I really appreciate while I've got you on a live call, I'll say it to your face. Thank you. When you message and have a question, you get a reply. Hey, I screwed up this part of the invoice this in, <laughs> all right i'll fix it and he sends me a video telling me all right here's how yeah. you do it hey maybe we should schedule a refresher course uh, <laughs> like, let's jump on again go over this one again here. the the tech supports there it's really pretty easy um in fact i was surprised we went through uh my onboarding call and we went through it and i was really surprised as to how easy I was doing it. It's, um, it's, it's a little more, I'm not, I'm, it's not more complicated. I'm not as familiar with it when you do, um, an invoice only, um, yep. if you're a contractor or if you have to split a job into multiple, you're doing some yep. this week. Some Those weeks. features are coming soon. So I oh. know what you mean. So no, it's important that you know that <clears> because <throat> even me, and the thing is people don't, some people don't like people just come in the drip jobs. They like, Oh, I'm like some tech guy. No, I own a painting business and I use this every day and I run into these things like, okay, well, it rained on Monday and well, yep. we're not going to go Tuesday and Wednesday, but we got to go back Thursday and Friday. We need a way to, to, to schedule those on separate right. days. So it's on the radar, man. And I love that, man, because the feedback is good. I don't take it personal. I'm like, okay, well, you know, we got to knock that no, out too. I, I didn't mean it. It's, it's an opportunity, I guess. It um, it's, it's easy to implement it. If you are not uh tech savvy tech savvy and you're using joyce or quickbooks now i gotta tell you i've used quickbooks it's way easier than quickbooks you will be booking jobs and entering people yeah. in in five and it minutes. integrates nope. with quickbooks if you use it for yep. like your accounting for and stuff. your accounting i hate no. quickbooks i am like anti-quickbooks i even at this stage with my level of technical acumen i still can't navigate quickbooks effectively no it's tough it's tough One 
that's really nice that Drip Jobs gives you as a selling point is you've got your own link. And I put it on my Instagram, my Facebook. <laughs> Everyone loves the link, dude. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. One job, one job pays for it for the year. Plus. Yeah. Plus. Yeah, it's huge. Aaron, thank you, my friend. As always, you always bring your energy and boost up, boost me up, man. Um, Thank you again for your time. Obviously, this, you know, everything was raw. So again, my goal is to get this software in as many people's hands as possible uh, for the for the mission and what it's doing. It's freeing you, freeing your time, it's helping you grow. I mean, what greater uh, purpose is that, man? So thanks again, bro. I appreciate you. No problem. I appreciate you. Have a great All day. All right, man.